So the floor is yours. Sure, thank you. Well, the whole floor. So before this begins, I need at least one person to say, I don't know anything about digital stories. I if like not, it won't story. work. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Perfect. All right, he is. I like it. So I'll show an example. Hopefully, y'all don't mind a particular topic. Going according to her plan, she had set for herself until one fatal night. On September 19, 1999, Sabarito and her two friends were struck by a drunk driver, causing their car to go up in flames. Her two best friends were killed immediately as Jacqueline was pinned underneath the car, screaming for someone to save her from the fire melting and burning away her flesh. Jacqueline was finally rescued and escaped this tragic scene with third degree burns. This hopeful young girl underwent 40 surgeries, with many more to come throughout her life. This is Jacqueline Sabarito now. How is it, many wonder, that such a kind, loving girl, with a bright future and so much to offer, could become the victim of such a misfortune? This is a question that many struggle to answer and have often never seemed to be able to come to a conclusion with. When appearing on The Oprah Show many years after her accident, Jacqueline was asked how she would be able to move on with her life. She states, If a person stumbles, he must pick himself up and keep going. I believe this is very important. If not, life would not make much sense. She further explains perspectives and finding the meaning in the moments in which you must fight for your life, very similar to author Viktor Frankl and his work, Man's Search for Meaning. One of the obstacles that Sabarito, as well as other victims of an entity of tragedies experience, is the ability to forgive. For this girl, this obstacle is the key to being able to move forward with her life. Jacqueline was able to face the driver, the hair, and the facts of what happened. She realized that she had an immense amount of pent-up resentment towards this man, and through letting this anger go, she was able to begin to rebuild her life and move on. So much can be learned from icons such as Jacqueline Sabarito, as well as many others in large appreciation to their helping people find answers to the seemingly unanswerable. How can one find reason and motivation to move forward when all hope and light of the future seem to vanish? It's when you stop focusing on the little things and appreciate each and every opportunity you have to live. In the darkest of hours, Jacqueline was able to look within herself and express to others that hope is inevitable. It's always there. Sometimes you just need to look a little harder. So this was a digital story uh, done by a student in a class at the University of Richmond two semesters ago. This is just one sort of example of, of uh, what is getting created. For digital stories, basically, yes, they're very much uh, narrative. They typically have both audio and video or still images uh, that, that uh, somehow amplify or sometimes actually tell the story, you know, sort of pictures of a thousand words kind of thing. Um, they're very much very personal. Uh, in this case, it wasn't about the person who actually was giving the digital story, uh, but uh, that actually adds a little bit that I'll be talking about later, but it's oftentimes used in any of these things from reflective and visual slideshows up through more informative kind of presentations. We had one on uh, Phineas Gage, which was actually a lot of like all these gory examples. Um, <laughs> <laughs> if you don't know Phineas Gage, um, he, he was a, a very interesting uh, situation where um, he was a real uh, way worker and uh, he had a pole that lobotomized himself, but he actually had uh, survived it. Uh, I mean, four hours later, he was uh, wanting to work again, kind of thing. Uh, but it very much changed um, his uh, neural pathways, as you would expect, and uh, because it was a very large pole. And, uh, but nonetheless, it, it became a very interesting early uh, biological or sort of uh, experiment. Um, uh, not, not intentionally, but, but provided um, a lot of interesting things. And so in the case of that digital story, it was uh, very informative uh, because it went into a lot of the neuroscience. Um, but typically, it's something where you're kind of revealing characteristics of the author. And uh, there's definitely a, lots of different formats, frameworks for digital storytelling. Uh, one of the fathers of it, uh, one of the parents of digital storytelling, uh, is Joe Lambert. He runs the Center for Digital Storytelling uh, in New York, but he, they do uh, sort of walking shows around campuses and 
of course, there's a series of various books. And there's, in that particular framework, there's these seven elements that are usually considered and what we try to have the students focus on with regard to their digital story. And uh, so uh, there might be various uh, incarnations of this sometimes, uh, different wording and phrases, but in effect, these are the things that we ask students to uh, pay attention to. The actual process of creating a digital story, at least as the way we have uh, imagined it at the University of Richmond, is that people will start off with a Google document. Uh, so so we're, we're in effect already talking about sort of uh, some IT fluency and, uh, and, and computer skills. Uh, they work with uh, collaborative tools to develop their scripts. Uh, they're writing their uh, document there. And of course, they'll work with each other about it, iterative improvement. They work back and forth with their instructor. And that's typically part of the project. They'll then go ahead and record their voice. Uh, of course, we ask them to rehearse it several times. Uh, they'll, we typically recommend Audacity just because it's a nice freeware tool for being able to do that and kind of staying out of any particular video editing tool to be able to do that. Also, it's a pretty low learning curve tool, and again, it teaches one tool that doesn't have a huge learning curve but can pay off for them in future projects. Within then uh, Flickr, our Creative Commons, and Google Images, of course, people just think uh, to some degree, especially uh, earlier in their career, um, that anything that's out there is available for their taking and for their recreation. And so we use this as an opportunity to talk about licensing, intellectual property, copyright, all those kinds of things. And so uh, we'll, we'll go through that uh, format with them. But this is where they kind of learn how to incorporate the visual elements into their stories. And typically, we'll have them do a lot of still images because uh, they're not necessarily going to be creating, and they might create still images, but it's more difficult to teach students, or perhaps in a history class, to actually develop their own video assets, to record their own material, to talk to them about uh, focus and zoom on cameras and all that kind of equipment and all those kinds of uh, concerns. So oftentimes it's gathering images that will uh, lend something to the story. It can be very concrete kinds of visual examples. Sometimes it's somewhat figurative, and, uh, and that leads up uh, some, some creativity for the authors. And then putting the story together, we typically just have them do iMovie because it's a pretty easy tool, and they will come across it again sometime in their four years. Uh, but we do have Movie Maker up there just to try to be uh, PC, Mac, um, uh, independent. Then they'll publish their story. Uh, typically, we have them do it to YouTube. Um, we can, you know, the different classes will do it different ways, and they might have an opportunity where they uh, set it for private, might be unlisted, or, or in uh, some cases, they just want it uh, completely open. And sometimes that's the case of the instructor, and we also talk about uh, for both kinds of things, and they can use pseudonyms and things like that. But in effect, they're uh, launching into part of the sort of scholarly communication, even if it's YouTube as far as that. So reasons for DST. Well, first, we don't want it to be the nail, and we're the hammer, that we just look for nails all around campus. Uh, we want to make sure that it aligns with the instructor's goals. In some cases, uh, in a lot of cases, even to this point at our institution, people don't yet know what digital storytelling is. So in some cases, faculty will and uh, will say, I like to do something different with my students uh, for them to create an, uh, some kind of product of their learning and assess it and uh, talk about it and describe it in such a way that maybe digital storytelling is the thing uh, that we would do with their, their class. And sometimes it isn't. Uh, but definitely that's the first thing that we care about. Beyond that, it's uh, different modalities. Um, thinking about sort of communication skills, uh, in effect, it's like a writing assignment. They have to do a script. Uh, in some cases, especially first-year seminars, uh, they might be used to the five to seven page paper kind of thing. They might be used to the one to two page paper thing. Uh, but they don't necessarily think about the economy that they have to think about with regard to a three to five minute digital story that they create. And so that process of editing themselves is sometimes uh, done because it's in a different, even though it's writing, it's done in a different mode. They're, they're of course, thinking about um, their material in different ways, how they chunk it. They're doing it for oration. They're not necessarily doing it for, uh, for readership 
identify their audiences. They have to keep those kinds of things in mind. So it kind of gets to that from a different angle. Same thing with uh, um, reinforcing scholarly communications. Uh, the way we do it with students, they have to cite their work. So the, the images that they use as part of that Creative Commons and the searching technique and, and thinking about copyright, they need to uh, reference those just like they would uh, papers uh, that they would reference in, in their written papers. So they're again getting at, at it from a different angle and they're seeing how this reinforces each other. Uh, peer teaching and learning. Uh, in some cases, the students or the faculty create their assignment in such a way that the students are meant to be working on different projects such that the showcase opportunity at the very end of the semester or at the end of the exercise is something where they can, in effect, learn something, not just kind of sit there with popcorn and soda and watch each other's uh, presentations and possibly not just peer assess uh, their, their classmates, but also that they're actually learning something through that effort. So uh, that's an opportunity there. And of course, for our office, a lot of it is that we are getting some feedback occasionally uh, from some particular programs and career development where they're saying, gosh, it'd be great if these students learned a little bit more X, Y, Z. Uh, that's the kind of feedback that they get from their recent uh, late graduated. So that's one of the things that we think about. So how did this begin at uh, U of R? Well, uh, a lot of it starts uh, occasionally that, or it, from time to time where you have a person who's very uh, interested. In this case, we had a student uh, or one of our um, people, an instructional technologist, who was looking to finish his PhD. So that, that's one of the motivating <laughs> factors. Uh, but nonetheless, we had a framework around where we had uh, great multimedia development support. We had a lot of resources that I'll talk about in a sec um, that, that helped kind of pre create that infrastructure where great things can happen. Uh, we also have eager faculty, uh, in certain cases at least, uh, who, who are looking for a new thing to do. Typically people who are sort of mid-career and are saying, you know, we've, I've done this, I've been there, done that kind of thing, and they're looking for something new to kind of spruce up the way they are uh, thinking about a course. And sometimes this can be thought of as a very primitive kind of thing. I mean, I have a nine-year-old daughter who's doing a digital story in her class definitely to a different scale. I don't think they're kind of going through the same things. I think their rubrics are a little bit uh, gentler. Uh, but nonetheless, um, it, it, there, there can be a sense of that, which I'll get to also. So anyhow, um, these are some things that, uh, that kind of created this to happen for our school. The resources that we have to be able to put into this is, first of all, and, and a lot of this kind of came just last minute because I was thinking more about uh, the reason why I picked digital storytelling to share with you all is because it is one of our, uh, not just success stories, but it is talking about it, how we work with a lot of different uh, people on campus and how uh, this is touching a lot of different pieces even within our own offices. So gosh, I realize you all don't know how things are oriented, even though Pat's kind of talked about it a little bit. Um, earlier. So uh, we have a Center for Teaching, Learning, and Technology. It falls under Information Services. So um, we, we have currently implemented some of the aspects of what would be a CTL kind of environment, but in general, uh, most people will think of us uh, to some degree as, as technologists on campus uh, who are uh, academically inclined. There's two sides to it, and uh, the liaison group, uh, the liaison, as far as it's kind of similar to some of the phrasing that library liaisons used to use at various times, but we think of our academic uh, technology consultants or instructional technologists as people who are working with particular disciplines or divisions of disciplines. Uh, we try to look for uh, experience uh, when we're hiring people that they have, uh, let's say, some kind of background in poli sci or uh, anthropology, sociology, uh, geography, if they're working with the social sciences, and if they're working with the sciences, hopefully chemistry, biology, et cetera, I think you kind of get the picture. And so um, these are the people who also work as liaisons to the academic departments, uh, but generally they're instructional technologists. And so um, we have a, a manager uh, for that, and uh, that's me, I'm assistant director of the CTLT, but this is basically the way it's configured. Uh, then we have five basic instructional technologists, like I talked about. In general, they are generalists, but they do have this disciplinary expertise, typically. And then lastly, we have a media production coordinator, who also happens to be the liaison to the fine arts departments, as one could expect that there's a fair amount of overlap there. So it's basically having a staff of six, which is what I you know, my chuckling answer last night during 
uh, comparison of institutions that yes, we have a lot of resources to go put to this. Uh, but then we also have uh, a, a pretty broad school. Then the other half of the CTLT is our lab group, uh, which is somewhat similarly configured, and they uh, help maintain all and develop all the computer images for all the labs on campus. And in some degree, they work with us because we're working with faculty for their software requests and the components of the various class projects. And another important part is the Technology Learning Center, which is a specific lab that they manage that is going to be very closely configured with digital storytelling, which I'll also talk about. Um, so actually, I don't think I have a slide on that. So on our TLC, our Technology Learning Center, so we have a space where we have a training room, uh, a couple training rooms, then there's a large laboratory with uh, you know, dual monitors, Macs, they run Windows also. They have a lot of video editing software. They typically have the biggest load on campus as far as software goes because they'll have pieces and parts from all of campus. They'll have some chemistry and uh, some bodily computer science software. And uh, it's a place where they can have that access to advanced technology. It's also a place where they can do academic poster printing and scanning and whatnot. And there's also five editing suites where we have computers configured for that, for solitude and being able to do their editing. So that's a very critical part about uh, the resources for being able to employ for digital storytelling. But the biggest part of the TLC is the student staff. So we have about 25 student uh, staffers who go through uh, pretty rigorous training for their first year of employment, uh, especially the first six months, but then uh, it, it becomes less or so as they start getting into the more advanced topics. They're, they all have general basic uh, learning of particular software. They can all do Excel pivot tables uh, as one example. Uh, but some of them will learn uh, SPSS, and some of them will learn Final Cut Pro. All of them know iMovie, all of them know the tools that I'm talking about here for digital storytelling. Uh, but it kind of extends what um, we're able to do because those students are available for one-on-one -on -one appointments by the students who are doing digital stories. Um, so, let's see. Okay. Uh, so, what is the process as far as the faculty go through? So they go through, uh, we hope that they go through uh, one of our workshops, we encourage it as much as possible, but otherwise we give them a one-on-one -on -one grounding of what digital storytelling is. Sometimes people have come, in fact, we had someone come to us right after fall break saying, I'd like to do a digital story with my students. And of course, we're like, yes. And, and in the back of our offices, we're thinking, wow, that's gonna be a lot to do. Um, because they, they haven't had any sense of any of this. In their case, they're doing 70s, 80s popular music, they want their students to kind of create something like a, a pop video uh, with elements of narration to it. Uh, so there's a lot of different assets. We're definitely thinking about copyright and all that. So uh, that's involved here. So uh, we'll then work with the instructional technologists and some, uh, of course, uh, a librarian to talk about uh, finding a lot of these assets and thinking about copyright issues. Uh, they're typically working with a lot of these classes already for just elements of research. Uh, already, and so we'll be working with the faculty and have a small uh, team, if you will, but a, 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 at least a meeting to talk about well, what are their goals and how to actually go through all this process. And then uh, the instructional technologist is typically the one who kind of acts as the hub of, of that wheel, if you will, and uh, they'll coordinate the resources and also uh, we'll give an in-class workshop. They'll come to the uh, t one of our training rooms and we'll give them a one hour, one and a half hour, depends on uh, you know, the extent to what they're wanting to do, just so that they've seen it once. We have a lot of uh, resources, but in general, we found that students really uh, benefit from having that one class orientation uh, for learning at least some of the basics about uh, the, the framework of digital storytelling and also being able to uh, see some of the software. And we just do very short uh, entrances into all those applications, but to get a sense of it. And then uh, the students will create their uh, stories, and then of course there's uh, typically a classroom showcase. In some cases, they'll watch them outside of class, and then they'll come back, and almost like a flipped classroom, and they'll come back into class and actually discuss uh, each of the stories. And then uh, we, we, of course, uh, survey the faculty and students who are involved in this. So uh, as part of the workshop, we do you know corny kind of slides uh, that, that we have for, for some of these kind of things to describe uh, some of the elements. And we have a, a large website that, that we've created that serves as both a showcase for some of the exemplars that 
Uh, we regularly ask our faculty to submit to us some, some of the, the best things. Of course, that sets a bar for students and all that. It also gives an example for students as they're trying to think of topics or trying to think of particular projects, and also for faculty as well. It's a faculty resource uh, because we have elements of rubrics and things like that. Um, but we also have the tutorial section um, there that, that provides uh, basic standard kind of video uh, type tutorials uh, of a screen and a talking head of going through each of these uh, steps. Any questions so far? Yes? I've been working with faculty this semester on digital storytelling and one thing that came up was um, using music and dealing with copyright in their digital stories and I was wondering how you approach music. And Absolutely. Uh, so it, it differs depending upon the particular course involved in it and how we uh, treat that, and I did mention, but we have a similar approach as we do for Creative Commons. First of all, you can search for um, audio as well, uh, but we also subscribe to one of these royalty-free uh, databases, of, so people, students can go to a website and search for their kind of music, and then they come into the TLC, and they can get that asset and then incorporate that into their digital stories. We, but also we actually did that huge. too, and our library refused to pay for it. Mm -hmm. First, I don't remember Jonathan's reasoning, but it ticked him off or something. So, so we ended up we ended up paying for it um, and putting it in our Center for Creativity so that our students have access to a royalty-free music mm -hmm. thing. So. Sure. Uh, the, the, where it came from our campus, it was actually University Communications. So they had gotten this uh, for their ability to be able to do functional videos and whatnot. And so we have a site license for it, and we basically paid as an extra couple K for it. And it, it's now kind of relevant for all of campus. And so it's a great resource. To, in, in fact, we kind of wrote on the coattails of communications with all of their, their budget kind of stuff. And you said they search for it, and then they have to come in to get the file? Right. Yeah. Yes, if they choose that particular technology. Now, iMovie has huge access to lots of it. As they're going through the process, uh, they can click on the little musical note kind of thing, mm -hmm. and it has a lot of uh, music for at least instrumental, I think, for, for being able to back them. Yeah. But, but our tool, the best part about this uh, one that they subscribe to is you can kind of pick it by tempo, genre of music, uh, and, and uh, emotion, I guess, and you know various the other kind of factors. Do you know the name of it? Yeah, Video Helper. Just one word, video helper. It was originally called Killer Tracks, I think. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but anyhow, yeah, that video helper earlier, digital story. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Sorry. <laughs> 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 um, yes. Um, evidently, you can. <laughs> if your presentations were used exclusively within Rich and not public, does that, can you use, um, Regular, you know, normal music that's copyrighted under the. Uh, I'm kind of in mm -hmm. sure. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. It's, that, that's yeah. how we use box in classes or music classes. We keep it behind the firewall and set yeah. permissions where mm -hmm. they can't download it or share it. Mm -hmm. So it's, that's it's, what we do. So it's hard because if, if you're not making the excuse that you're using it for commentary, you know, your fair use kind of starts diminishing your 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 grounds for that. Uh, but. Yeah, to some degree we have some faculty who will uh, just keep behind the firewall kind of thing, yeah. you know, save within Blackboard or something like that, and we do it that way. That's sort of where my question lies. Have you had to deal with faculty who, I don't, I don't want to say have a disregard, but um, <laughs> well, I don't, do I need to finish the rest of the question? No. It's, it's just basically, what? how do you get over that barrier? What, what do you use as a technique to deal with? Um, well, we, the law, mean, really. I mean, just, you know, just, it's the law I'm bringing in. Right. I mean, we, we, right. Right. faculty are very interested in, in their students learning some elements of information literacy. They, it's, it's an actual component of our first year seminar program that all students can, uh, when they're freshmen, you know, can go through. So it's, uh, it's something that, that we have pretty good partnership with faculty about. Uh, we don't make it in such a way that it over, uh, over uh, runs the rest of the project. Uh, we, we do it in a respectful kind of way as a, as a fraction of the entire project. But you have Joe Essig who believes all information should be Yes, <laughs> yes. 
Yeah, we might have someone who knows about some of our faculty. Um, so, yeah. yes. I mean, he and I, this faculty yes. member and I used to have this running joke that when he got thrown in jail, I would bail him out. <laughs> because he believes that all information should be free and he absolutely, positively will not pay any attention to copyright. And he's not the only faculty member. No, no, no he's sure. absolutely yes. not. No, yeah. no, no. no. And, and so, in some, I and mean, we haven't had to actually pull this out, but I guess in some degree we could, if, if we really ran into a situation where it was something like that, we would just say, we're able to work within these guidelines, and so you know, if, if they are very much added to do that component, then they're free to be able to do that part of the, the process, and that would be entered in part of the initial project. I think but it hasn't happened yet. We've had typically 12 faculty a semester since 2007, 2008. You're setting the tone and the culture, though, with that. With that. Mm -hmm. Oh sure. Mary. Some of the things out from the beginning. I think there's also, I mean, I had conversations at a, at a previous institution which talked about your personal liability, but one of the things I didn't want anybody else making this decision for faculty members, so I would say it is your decision, and I'll give you the four factor, and I'll give you all the information you make it. Yes, the in institution will indemnify you, so I mean, you're not going to lose your house if you go to court and do this, that will stand behind you, but you will be in court. And, so, and it's your decision, because I do believe it is a faculty member's decision to make that sure. question over fair use. That really helped them a lot, because it turned around and they were, well, you had to say for yourself, this is what I'm going to stand in front of a judge and say, you know, that I mean, really, we really are talking about a legal issue, and I probably am closer to the information free, or at least in the fair use kind of place, of wanting to turn around and try to say that. So I put things behind the firewall and always have put things behind the firewall to turn around and say, am I comfortable? Not that I'm going to be in court. <laughs> sure. But I think that's been my test. Well, how would I feel standing in front of a judge? Can I get out of punitive damages? Can I at least turn around and say, here's the thought process I went through. Here's the rationale I went through. If I think that that makes us in a reasonable case, because it's not all cut and dry. But, but tonight, at, at, it's at Perlman's thing, there is going to be some music and video playing before he plays, of him playing. And the, the people who are running this show wanted to just put YouTube up and have YouTube playing there, which is absolutely against the licensing right. of YouTube right. right to be able to do that. <coughs> yeah. And they kept insisting that that's what they were going to do. And I finally had to put my foot down and say, no, you will not do it. I will not allow the college to be under that level of liability. That Winter Park is full of way too many lawyers. Right. There's going to be way too many lawyers in the audience. And you will not do that. End of discussion. It will not happen. And so then they had to go out and they had to buy the rights to be able to show whatever it is they've decided to show tonight. But every once in a while, you just have to say, the college is not going to allow this because you're putting the college at too much risk. But that's also, I mean, I find that if you're turning around, my arguments have been with people saying, I'm sorry, the communication department, not academic, your marketing department, cannot claim fair use. Right. And it's not just because you work for a higher ed institution, which is... Where, so I absolutely agree in that, that you turn around and say, no, you don't have that protection. That is an institutional yeah. use for some other function. Yeah. But then also, how much of this are we supposed to know as instructional technologists? A lot. Versus librarians? I think mm -hmm. it's both of our responsibilities. So I think it's an either hat that you have to wear to turn around and, and do that. If you look at the Associate College of Research Libraries, ACRL, guidelines for information literacy, which we think of even for the instructional technologists, <laughs> should apply as citizens, uh, that, that copyright is kind of one of the areas. So we do ask that there's some general knowledge. And yes, uh, for our faculty, one of the biggest things is people get the copy, might get the copyright thing in general. They might not get the MCA, TJAC, and all that. But typically, they want to understand how terms and conditions are kind of overall because you're, you're choosing to use that resource and when you choose to use it, in effect, you need to abide by their things. It's a, it's a contract that, or agreement that you make with the uh, provider and so 
some right. people don't think about that. I would also say the best faculty I found, if you wanted to involve them in a conversation, if you've got anybody on your faculty who is on your music faculty, mm -hmm. who is a composer. Absolutely. So if you talk to them because they are torn six ways from Sunday about this, you know, <laughs> that they want to be able to use this in their teaching and they understand, but they also don't want people ripping off their own work. Mm -hmm. And so I found them to be really great people to turn around and try to talk to other faculty about what are all the issues around here and why it is so important to follow those restrictions. Sure. I know right now we're trying to put together this copyright, I guess, policy. Yeah, Jonathan and I are trying to redo the copyright policy for the institution because it's not very yeah. well done at the moment. Mm -hmm. And so we're, like, he presented this checklist, basically. Um, we had a faculty workshop, mm -hmm. and he presented this kind of like this checklist you can go through to um, decide whether your, whatever you're putting up in is yeah. valid. And it, it seemed to um, spark a lot of interest some people chose to follow it, others not. But the idea is to maybe put that checklist in place before we put up anything, right? So the faculty actually, like, and they actually have to prove that they did the checklist, like, kind of store it with the file that they put up. Is that something you'd be willing to share with the group somehow? I'd like to see yeah. what your checklist Yeah, if you actually, if you go to UNC or Cornell or yeah. University of Georgia, right. um, it, they all are using basically the right. same checklist, and that's the one we sold. Yeah. <laughs> and that's the same thing we were using yeah. when I was having these conversations. And it wasn't so much storing it that I said, I think you should go through this, and if I were you, I'd keep a copy. But, yeah. you know, again, it's sort of their responsibility because they are making those choices. This is sort of a related question. Like for people doing flipped lessons, you know, or lecture capture, you know, I, I think like copyright's not thought about in that context. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if, if that's an issue. You know, if I'm showing images in my lecture and I don't own the copyright for that, you know, does that fall under educational use or commentary or, or what? I can tell you that our business faculty think about their capture of their lectures as very much as their intellectual property. Mm -hmm. They don't want those lectures made freely available mm -hmm. because that's their intellectual property. Mm -hmm. So they're thinking about it from the internal. Though the business faculty, of course, have a little bit different thought process than most of the others. Sure. Well, there's just one more slide I think that I'll get to. Possibly. There you go. Sure. Um, that's good. Uh, so, faculty development. So, we first uh, do the workshops and whatnot. We also have a faculty academy, a week long institute. This is kind of all along the lines of some of the things that people said that they have at their schools. So, in this case, um, faculty are there for a whole week. We They propose to actually uh, come to uh, the week long workshop. And we typically have more than one track. So digital storytelling falls under one that we call digital media production. Um, and then we have another track typically for, what? Well, oh gosh, it's a long one, technology facilitated course design. Uh, typically it's a little bit along the lines of LMS uh, meets course and trying to do deeper uh, real use of uh, such an application. Sometimes we'll go into uh, wikis and uh, journals and things like that. Uh, it usually starts off with concept mapping. They don't even touch a computer the first day. Um, so that's an opportunity that faculty have, and, and so it's real deep, but of course we can only hit so many faculty uh, during a particular year. Uh, community of practice, once we had started doing this for a couple of years, uh, we, we saw that there's a, a, an opportunity for having some uh, sort of priming of the pump, some, some uh, self-development of this, and some faculty do become good champions of such a, a project, and they can help uh, continually develop their faculty colleagues. And so we've developed a community practice around this and some of our other initiatives that we do. Uh, we do faculty luncheons, we do the brown bags and all that kind of stuff. So typically one per year, one every couple of years will be about digital storytelling as one of the opportunities. It's very much discussion, no presentation, none of this kind of you know, teaching about DST. It's really meant to talk about it. But typically we'll have some faculty who are current practitioners and some who have never touched it but have heard of it. And so it's a, it's a different kind of venue for being able to have these conversations. Uh, of course, we have the uh, faculty learned uh, DST site, 
And then we'll, um, for cross-pollinating, we also have these, Pete uh, had mentioned this before, it's called Program for Enhancing Teaching Effectiveness uh, on our campus. And so, uh, in effect, it's a committee that uh, has a, a, a couple budget lines, one for being able to uh, support uh, faculty in their uh, curricular development and, and, in some cases, uh, semi-scholarship teaching kinds of projects. Oftentimes it's travel related and ability to uh, present some of the things that they built for the courses. And then the other part of it typically are these faculty luncheons for uh, bringing the people to campus or within the campus community, uh, picking particular topics. So typically we'll do one of those um, a, a, a semester where we'll ask the faculty to create a panel of uh, faculty who've done digital storytelling. And sometimes they'll be uh, critical. We look for people who do it the sort of the uh, standard kind of way, and then some who do these various flavors of digital search home where they're not actually doing narratives, but might be a little bit more informational or something like that. Um, we have Pete After Hours that we kind of developed as, as, to kind of uh, climb on or to uh, bump onto uh, Pete's uh, function. And it's one of these wine and cheese kind of opportunities where faculty get like a very short time, 10, 15 minutes for doing their presentations. And so typically, uh, occasionally, uh, someone will talk about digital storytelling as part of that. So we're kind of looking at the different angles for, for people being able to hear us because everyone has a different interest and availability for being able to attend uh, university functions. So we look for that. And then we have a learning enrichment newsletter where we focus on one particular faculty member per issue. And it's usually done on a semi kind of interview kind of way uh, for the lead article and it's how they're using technology they're teaching. Uh, so it's a way to kind of show some of the things that we do, but definitely in a more softer approach than what would be a hard sell of our, uh, our services. So um, in some cases it might be uh, for digital start tone, someone who's done DST, and usually it's very uh, even, sort of, you know, there's definitely going to be a critical element to that kind of story uh, for being able to talk about, well, why are you really doing it, and, and, and what are the challenges with it, and all that kind of stuff. And so that's usually one article. Um, that, that we have, and so typically in a year we do about once a month, so about 10 articles, you know, 10 newsletters, and one of them might be about DST. And then, of course, again, the LinDST site is its own cross pollinator. So, who's Don's, responsible yeah. for the newsletter? Who puts that together? Our instructional technologists. So, we, we're really? somewhat generalists, but, but we, have, uh, we haven't set up in such a way yeah, yeah, that each like has a particular responsibility. So, one is kind of our lead on our LMS, one is the lead on sort of clickers and and when one works on iPads, and so he or she coordinates the iPad that all the other instructional technologists are, are sending out to their classes. And in the case of uh, DST, there's one who, who kind of coordinates all the other instructional technologists on DST. So um, they help coordinate when we do surveys of the students, and they make sure that it, you know everything for the events, the workshops, are going to coordinate that there aren't going to be two classes at the same time. Does anybody else try a newsletter? We did in the past, and then kind of did away with it. Really fell on my area, trying to get also other people to contribute. But we that was probably back in 2009 to 2011, and then we stopped. Sure. So we so the one instructional technologist kind of access or editor in chief. Um, he or she would then work with whoever the instructional technologist who typically supports that particular faculty member who's chosen for that issue, and uh, to actually do the interview. And so that. Liaison is the one who kind of creates that article, and then it's done editing by the editor. And then the person who's in charge of the LMS Blackboard usually submits a small column. And then typically we just have one just general tech tip or some interesting thing, you know, Apple's new you know, iPad Air or something like that. And then usually we pick one provocative topic on a sort of a teaching learning topic, and each of the instructional technologists has two or three sentences uh, response to that. And so it's a way to help faculty realize that we aren't just the gadget freaks or the tech freaks, where the people kind of know a little bit about teaching. And so um, that kind of incorporates uh, some of those elements there. And so that's typically a newsletter. It's typically just back in front or maybe three pages tops. And uh, this goes out to just faculty? Um, we, we, yeah, primarily goes out to faculty. It, typically it's electronic now, but for our um, adjunct faculty who work in continuing studies, uh, we do print out a lot of copies uh, for their offices. We usually have a few printed out for our IS help desk, you know, to where people kind of will get service points, our library main service desk, but otherwise it's available electronically. 
So really, it, it can go out to anyone, uh, but it's targeted towards faculty and to some degree the staff who support faculty as well. We uh, use our Facebook page for some of this type of things, whether it be like tutorials or new technology available, uh, events, things of that sort. It's kind of, the only bad thing is we don't get very many likes. It's available to public, so. I've run over my time. No, no, that's okay, that's okay. Other questions for Fred? No.